Thank you, choir. That was lovely. If you would rise as you're able for our call to worship this morning. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 34, 1 through 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes me boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt God's name together. Amen. If you would remain standing for our opening hymn, I love to tell the story.
Amen. What a great hymn. You may be seated now. Thank you so much. Um, this morning, uh, as we continue our stewardship vision for 2024, uh, 25 rather, um, we have Judy Matting who would like to give her testimony to us this morning. And please be prayerful and mindful as she gives these words to us. Good morning. Jerry and I were asked to share with you our witness concerning our stewardship and how the Lord has blessed us. 2 Corinthians 9.6 has always been the verse I think about when discussing stewardship. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. As I look back over the last few years, I'm overwhelmed thinking about all the blessings the Lord has given us. Each year, we have tried to increase our giving of our finances and our time, and each year we are amazed at the blessings we have received in return. We have two granddaughters who enjoy spending time with us. We have a close-knit family, most of who live in this area. We have our health. Jerry has been cancer-free now for six years. <laughs> We're able to travel and explore this beautiful country we live in, and we have our church family. We started our faith journey helping to teach Sunday school when our son was a toddler. We've watched our Sunday school kids grow, become friends with their families, and work together to teach our children about Jesus and his love for us. Becoming involved in Sunday school has opened up new opportunities to serve in other areas, making new friends and becoming a part of the church family. Each time we participate with an event, attend a small group, or lend a helping hand, it opens up another opportunity to expand our friendships and our church family. Our church family has become an important part of our lives, sharing in our joys and in our sorrows. Although it's always easy to share in each other's joys, our church family has been there in our sorrows and our times of concern and worry. Whether it's keeping us in their prayers, sitting with us in the hospital, consoling us in the loss of a loved one, or a phone call, just to know, let us know that we're cared about. All the while, giving us encouragement to remind us that God is good and he's always working for the good in our lives. We have so many blessings to be thankful for and our church family at Grace is a very important one. We're anxious to see what other blessings the Lord has in store for us as we continue to grow in our Christian discipleship. Thank you, Judy. Stewardship isn't just about money, is it? It's about our time that we give to the Lord as well and how we influence our community with our faith. All of that is stewardship, not just money. This morning we have one more announcement. Um, on Sunday, November 24th, Grace will be celebrating the season of Thanksgiving. Turkey and dressing and all the trimmings will be served right after our worship on the 24th. Um, and we, don't we, have so much to be thankful for. We live in a wonderful country. We have blessings beyond belief. This meal is open to all, and there's no charge or donation collected that day. A sign-up sheet is on the table outside the office, so please let us know if you'll be coming to share the blessing of this day set aside for Thanksgiving with us. Thank you. And that's all of our announcements this morning. Um, we will be continuing to our congregational prayer now. If you would like to pray at the rail, you're welcome to, or pray in your seats. Thank you.
God, Father, friend, mentor, shepherd leading us beside still waters, we offer our praise this morning. We worship you as our Lord of Lords. We acclaim your Holy Son, Jesus. We give thanks for your messenger and comforter, the Holy Spirit. If we lived 10,000 years, we could not offer up enough praise. And as we believers join you in your eternal kingdom, we will praise you 10,000 years and beyond. Hear our pleas this morning, Lord, for our tithes and sacrificial offerings to be used wisely and for your glory in our community, for the individuals in our city, Decatur, to break the ties of the evil one and join your believers in living godly lives, for the United States of America to return to those principles that made us revolutionary and a great nation, a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, and secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. For our national and local elections to be a celebration of our democracy in which eligible voters turn out in numbers never seen before and God, for the election to be your will, your will be done. We trust in your divine plan. We may not always see where you are leading us, but we know you have, a, you have promised only good to your believers. For our students and teachers to be safe in their classrooms and for their minds to be open to your guidance. For the lonely, the sick, and the grieving, to be wrapped in the arms of your Holy Spirit, your Comforter, where they may find your spiritual presence, the miracle of your healing, and the consolation they yearn for. We ask all this in the name of your Holy Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Amén. Morning Church. Morning. Shall we now rise to continue to worship God with some praise music? I want you to turn to your neighbor. If you don't have a neighbor, you know what I mean. Turn to your neighbor. If you don't have a neighbor, find a neighbor and say, thank you for being here to worship the Lord with me. Let's do that. Let's do that. Find a neighbor. Yes. Did we all find a neighbor? Okay. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Just as you are before your God, come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to work. the time to give your heart. Come, come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come, one day. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. One day, one day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Open the eyes, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Let's sing one more time. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. 
Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see. song build your kingdom here come set your rule and reign in our hearts again increase in us we Oh, 
Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to give. Lord, we bring our tithes and offerings for your service for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Lord, bless the gifts and bless the givers. In Jesus' precious name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Church, let's uh, greet one another. And again, if you find anybody sitting or standing alone, make sure that before we go into the word of God, we are able to sit with them. Thank you. 
as you were as you return to your seats as you return to your seats we'll hear the word of god i'm going to have to shout Let's listen to the word of God. Our scripture this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 6 and 7. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And also from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Remain standing for our spirit song. message title today is my story God's glory each one of us has a story why we exist why we are here what we are doing and each one of us is valuable in God's sight amen are you able to hear me clearly yes I tried to put a tape here and so that this microphone can be closer to my mouth and as I said that each one of us uh, have a story and uh, I'm going to ask Melinda to just raise hand or please rise. In Melinda's story, we just had her birthday yesterday. So why don't we just say happy birthday to Melinda? Happy birthday to you, belated one. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Melinda. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Please be seated. I don't know who else is celebrating birthday this week, but my wife's birthday is coming this Wednesday. So if you don't see her around, when you see her, just you can give her a wish her a happy birthday. All right. Anybody else's birthday today? Anybody celebrating birthday today? No? No one? Okay, good. Tell me, are we good to go? Yes? I will ask the choir too. Guys, are we good to go to deliver the word of God? You know what I mean? Do you see anybody sitting alone? No? So we are good. Okay, good job, church. Let me start with this picture here. Anything we think of, we build, we make, we invent, we always think about the purpose behind it. Everything that you see around which has been made or built has had a purpose uh, behind it and had a meaning behind it. Just looking at uh, the, the wall clock, 
Wall clock, what do you think? What was the purpose? To tell what? Time. How about the house? To? To shelter, to live in. Tell me about the car. Transportation. I, most of you came by some transportation today. All right. So when we look at things, we begin to see the purpose behind that there is someone who made it, created it, invented it, but with a purpose. How about shoes? Anybody without shoes today? Okay. So why? Pardon me? Is there a purpose or without purpose you are wearing shoes? Is there a purpose? Yes. To protect our feet. And now there can be different kinds of shoes. How about the plane? Pardon me? Vacation. Okay. <laughs> All right. Whatever. You know what I'm talking about. When we have to go thousands of miles away, we need some better transportation, maybe speedier transportation. So we think about plane, the people who came up with that idea and then who developed on that idea and gave us the plane. How about a church building to worship? So you see, I just gave you an example that, a few examples that anything and everything we make or build, invent, has a purpose behind it. So all of us, we are on the same page. But at the same time, the second thing we see is when we give a purpose or when we build something, it has a purpose and second, it has value. So purpose and value, both we can see. And we know that, you know, some things are more valuable in our lives than other things. Start thinking about some of the things you just left in the lawn last night or in your backyard or the front porch and you say, I don't care about that. I'm not going to get up and go out. You did not value that. But if you leave your child behind, what would you say? I'm going to go and get the child. You even think, think about your dog, you, you know, all your pets. You see... We have purpose and we also add, attach value. So some people have more value in our lives. Some people have less value in our lives. We all know that, right? We have preferences. We have priorities just to show what we value. But as we are going into uh, the message today, I thought this is where we need to start. So all of us, though, Nobody uh, can say who made us cl uh, claim. You know, there are so many other claims going on around in the world, depending on whom you ask. But I want to ask you, what is the purpose of your life? Why do you exist? Why, if we collectively ask, why do we exist? Has there been someone who took the step to create us, made us, invent us? Why do we exist? What is the purpose of our life? What value, what worth do I have? Do you have? What's your net worth? These days in election season, you must have seen the news. You know, what is the net worth of this uh, candidate or that candidate? Uh, you know, so all those things are going on around in the world as we think about uh, value and worth. So if I ask you, each one of these items has a story behind it. What's your story? Why were you created? Why were you made? Maybe there are a certain uh, percentage of people in the world, especially in Europe and uh, North America, you will find that they said that, you know, we do not adhere uh, or hold on to uh, whatever other people believe, the existence of God. So what do they say when it comes to, you know, how did you come here? What's your story? So they adhere to, they hold on to scientific naturalism. Now, don't misunderstand. I value science. I thank God for the gift of science. And we all use science in our daily lives. Amen? So we are not opposed to that. But when it comes to the creation part, that who created you, who made you, who made me, there are a certain percentage of people who do not buy into uh, the, uh, the, the belief that God created us. So what do they say? Well, I believe in uh, scientific naturalism. What do they mean? Scientific naturalism simply means whatever we see in the nature and the laws of nature, that's what we believe. We do not believe any supernatural power came from outside of our nature and interfered in our lives and, and, and created us. They said we are the outcome of time, 
plus matter plus chance. So over the million years, time plus matter, there was a matter, and then by chance, we began we begin to evolve, and now we became human beings. Are you following what I'm saying? So there are a certain percentage of people, those who do not buy into the belief that God exists or God created us. Now, I will not go much more into this because we do not have the luxury of time to do that. But what do we see here? When we have that kind of point of view for our life, that natu uh, scientific naturalism that God does not exist, we just came, we happened to be here. So who defines the purpose? Do you remember we were talking about each and every item we are looking at, it has a purpose behind. You know, a creator, an inventor, a, a maker comes up with a purpose. You don't just start to uh, build things without any purpose. Anybody sitting here who has a plenty of time and just building stuff without any purpose? I don't think so. So when you ask those people, they can't tell you the purpose of your life. But they can just tell you that you can define one as you see fit. Right? So the whole world is trying to buy into that kind of philosophy. When I say whole world, I'm just uh, hyper, using a hyperbolic speech because majority of the world has lost the idea that there is a God who had a purpose in making us. You know, how do we know? Because everyone is trying to find their own definition of why we exist. So when you do not have a, a, a purpose for your life from the naturalistic scientific point of view, what do you do? Next thing, you find difficulty to, uh, to define what's your worth? What's your value? So you lost a purpose in the first place. The second thing happens subsequently is that you lose your value too. Whoever made these things, they made with a purpose and then they valued, they gave value. And we know that we, we pay money for certain things and we value them. But when it comes to humanity, so as I said to you, these people, if they take, the, take God out of that under, uh, a belief that God created us, and they will just say, we just happen to be here, time plus matter plus chance, they lose the purpose, why do we exist? They say, find it out, just do it by yourself. Second, they lose value then what do we do? We try to find our values, our worth in what we can achieve, earn, and do in our lives. So many people find what they can do. You know, when they introduce themselves, they are so and so. Why? Because they have, they have degrees, they have education, they have money, they have worth, and that makes them feel what? Valuable. Are you following what I'm saying? When we lose the purpose we lose the value, then we try to define our purpose, our value by the way the world dictates. Now, I'm not saying that earning good education, higher education is not valuable. I'm not saying that. But when you begin to find meaning and value in that, then you are going to lose it big time. Because if that is the only thing you are finding your, your meaning, your purpose, your value in, then you are going to lose a big time because there is no end to what you can achieve in this world. How much will make you feel enough? Where will you say, I'm going to put a full stop here? Ask rich people, they ask them, how much do you need more? Say, little more. <laughs> little more. Because they haven't found that they have that worth, they have that value in their lives. Am I making sense this so far? So, take an example, when we find, uh, uh, you know, anything, a painting, for example, we find a painting, what do we see? If a painting has been signed by someone, that tells that, who that painter is, if that painter is popular, artist is popular, with his signature, the value of the thing goes up, right? So scientific naturalism cannot give us no purpose, cannot tell us what value. So everyone is trying to find value in money, in education, in degrees, and whatever they can, so they can feel good. Again, don't misunderstand me. Becoming rich is not bad and evil. 
Becoming educated is not. I'm still a lifelong learner. After earning a terminal degree, I'm still a student, I tell you. Because the whole life is a learning process. Amen? I'm still a student. If you don't believe, you ask Asbury Theological Seminary. I'm enrolled at the moment as a student. So I value that. But I don't find my value in education. My purpose in education. I'm made for much more. Amen? That's what Melinda's song was saying. We are made for much more. So that's where we are going. What's your story? What's your story? For which glory are you living? What's your story? So when scientific naturalism cannot answer that question, we turn to God. You know why? Because as an artist, a painter comes up with his masterpiece and puts a signature there that tells why he did that and that even increases the value of the painting. You and I have a maker. Amen? Your life has God's signature on that. You are made by God. You have purpose. You have value. When God signed you on you, your value increased. If you want to ask, what's your worth? What's your value? What's your net worth? God was willing to pay his only son die on the cross for you. That's your worth. That's your value. Amen? Amen. I hope that some of you who find insecurity, who find uh, you know, uh, life anxious, I don't have enough, I don't have this, I don't have that, I want to become like this, or I want to earn that, just to get there and find emptiness, because you are finding something which doesn't exist unless we find that in God. Because God's signature is on you. And you are valuable. If you haven't found that value, today is the day for your salvation. Anybody sitting here, if you find value in your religion, forget about this. Religion is not going to save you. Jesus is going to tell you how much you are worth. And now, as we are talking about the value, we are also beginning to think about what is the purpose of my life. And as uh, we have read from the scripture this morning, that we, ha we have been made for the glory of God. God has created us for God's glory. There are two most important days in a person's life, the day the person is born, and the second important day is the day the person finds out why. So, we were born, but why? The scripture tells us that we were born to glorify God. We were born to glorify God. Now, when we think about we were born to glorify God, the scripture has clearly said everything he has created is to glorify him. Now, what does it really mean? mean you know sometimes we get stuck into is God really hungry for glory is he some kind of a monster who wants to just gobble all our glory from this world only then he will feel satisfied you know some people have this weird idea that there sits a God who says glorify me and he's hungry and thirsty for glory if you don't glorify will he cease to be a, a exist will he cease to exist Tell me, if you don't glorify God, will he cease to exist? Will you diminish his glory? No, God is already glorified God. So let's see what John Piper says. When it comes to, you know, God has created us to glorify him in Isaiah 43 verse 7. John Piper says he does not mean... He made us so that he could become more glorious in himself. We are not increasing God's glory by glorifying him. He's already glorified. What he means is that he created us to display his glory. That is, that is, that his glory might be known and praised. Who God is through our lives, may the world know. That is our purpose. So that we can display who God is to reflect 
the character of God, to reflect the glory of God. That is the meaning of this. Listen to C.S. Lewis. What does he say in The Problem of Pain, that book? A man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. So we ruled out that we cannot diminish God's glory by not glorifying him. And God is not hungry and thirsty for God's glory that if we don't do it, he will cease to exist because he's already glorified God. But what do we come to understand is if God out of his pleasure created us, made us with a purpose, that means if we are living out that purpose, we are living for the glory of God. Of God when all these things are functioning what do we do we are just telling wow what a beautiful house but who are we talking about we are talking about the architecture the builder right when you see a beautiful painting what do you see wow what a beautiful painting but then immediately you think about the creator the maker the artist that's where we are going with the message why God created us to glorify that when people see us, the world sees us, they give glory to God through our lives. When we live out the purpose God made us for, we are glorifying God. So it's not a complex uh, uh, concept when we think, you know, how can I glorify God? What should I do? What can I do to glorify God? So let me just take an example uh, uh, before we go into that, let's read Revelation chapter 4, verse 9 through 11. Let's read together so that we are all on the same page. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and he who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So the scripture is very clear. From Isaiah you take or you take it uh, from the book of Revelation that God created everything for his glory. So when God's creation comes before God, the first natural response has to be bow down before God and acknowledge, God, you made me for your glory and I worship you. So that is the kind of response. So when, the, when God's creation, instead of rebelling against God, instead of uh, denying his existence, when God's creation acknowledges God's exist, existence and stands in awe of God, in humility, acknowledging God's goodness, we are glorifying God. That's where the book of Revelation is taking us. When you read Psalm 19 verse 1, Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Before we even get further into understanding how we can glorify God, this is an excellent example. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies, his handiwork. What is hap happening in the heavens? We see all the planets, right? The sun, moon, and planets and galaxies, millions and millions of galaxies, the whole solar system orbiting around in its path without falling apart. What does it mean? It means it's displaying God's glory. Sun rises, sun sets, whatever you want to call. The beauty in the nature that we see, the, the, the sky as we look at, all that we see is displaying for what God made them. You know, when Genesis we read, God says he appointed sun to shine and also for, uh, for the moon to be overnight. So what the sun is doing, what the moon is doing, they are doing what they were told to do, they were set to do. So what is happening? The scripture says they are glorifying God. Am I making sense? 
So if you're wondering, you know, what, is the, what does it mean? How can I glorify God? Simply, number one, is by doing what God has made us to do. If each and everything we create, that means that tells about the maker. That tells good things about the maker. First Chronicles 16, 29, or uh, Deuteronomy 32, 3, 4, we see in the Old Testament, God's people knew that. Number one, they knew that with our mouths, our hearts, our minds, when we sing, we are glorifying God. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 29 says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. The glory we give God by lifting his name up, singing praises to him, and by ascribing greatness to our God as Deuteronomy 32 3 4 says for I will proclaim the name of the Lord ascribe greatness to our God the rock his work is perfect for all his ways are justice a God of faithfulness and without iniquity just and upright is he when we open our mouths in worship service or when we are alone, when we are at food time, sleeping time, whatever we are doing, when we begin to give God glory, acknowledge Him, that means we are glorifying God. So it's not just one time. Number one, opening our mouths, opening our hearts, thinking about how good God is. That's number one. So that's why when we come to worship God, don't just be spectators. If you cannot sing the song, at least have that heart and mind. Amen? If in your heart and mind, you are standing in the presence of God and just saying, Lord, I just praise you and I worship you. You are glorifying God. Then not glorifying God by simply being a spectator. So that is number one that we see in the scripture how we can glorify God. Number two, we display who God is through our lives with our deeds done through our actions. And I'm going to bring this uh, before us. First Kings chapter 10, verse 6 through 9. You already know King Solomon was one of the richest person or the richest person in that time. And also he was the wisest person at that time according to the scripture. And who gave him the wisdom and the riches. God gave him wisdom and the riches. Queen Sheba comes. Let's see what she is saying. Let's read together. She said to the king, the report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me. In wisdom and wealth, you have far exceeded the report I heard. How happy your people must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Let's read together verse 9. Praise be to the Lord your God who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. Let's just stop right here. Sheba realized this is not an ordinary person. Amen? All that he has, all that he's doing, Solomon must have acknowledged God. That's why Sheba says, you are right. This is God. Whatever you are doing through your life, your righteousness, your justice, your wisdom, your wealth, that displays the glory of God. One, with our mouth. Second, with our lives. When we live to do the things for God's glory, God is glorified. What's your story? When we read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So according to Ephesians, when we begin to do what God has created us to do, we are glorifying God. Matthew 5, 16 says, in the same way, let your light shine before the world, before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify. Amen? So, with our mouths, with our hearts, with our minds, and then with what we do. What did Jesus say? 17 verse 4. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me 
to do. So we continue to see in the scripture that we glorify God with what we do. And the last thing I want to say, we glorify God even putting our trust in Jesus. Then they asked him, what must, must we do to do the works of God? What God requires, Jesus answered. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. If you want to glorify God today, and if you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, right here, you can say, Jesus, I believe in you. You know, the moment you do that, you're glorifying your maker. Because Jesus came to save us, to bring us to our maker. Now, we are heading towards the closing part. And I want to ask you, what keeps us from glorifying God? Why we only look for our own glory? We find that story from the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, when Satan deceived Adam and Eve, instead of giving God glory, they wanted to become guards to find that glory. Soren Kierkegaard tells a story, and I hope that this story will make sense to you. He said, thieves, I'm paraphrasing the story, thieves went to a jewelry shop at night. Late at night, they went to a jewelry shop not to steal at night. You know what did they do? They went and they changed the tags. It was a very posh area jewelry shop. Diamonds and golds and all kinds of jewelry. You know what did they do? The cheapest jewelry in that jewelry shop, they exchanged the tags with the high price jewelry. And next day, they come and buy the cheapest tag with high jewelry. Are you following what I'm saying? That is the deception the enemy of our soul used. That's what the world is doing right now. They are blinded. The tags have been exchanged. The price tags have been exchanged. Why are we not glorifying God? Why are we only after our own glory? Because we did not realize but a price tag has been changed. How many of you are understanding right now what I'm talking about? Many of us are after the false deceptive price tag. Instead of looking for God's glory, we are looking for our own glory, trying to find in this world. If you want to find your story, our story is in God's glory. When we keep our focus clear on who God is and why he has created me and begin to sing and praise God number one and through our lives do the things that God has called us to do that will glorify him and number three trust in Jesus with all our heart we are glorifying God if we today take the time come to the table and find our own worth and repent from the false glory that we are after. No matter in what shape or form. Maybe today will be the day of salvation. Salvation means we have been set free from the false price tax. Each one of you is so valuable in God's sight. For his great purposes, you are made for much more than what we are doing right now. Amen. So I want to invite you now to find your worth at the table. Let us rise. I want to invite the servers to please come. Let us repent. Let's say, God, open our mind so that we can see the false price tags and put the right price tag on our lives and the right signature that we are God's. We belong to God. We are made for his glory. If we want to find our story, if we want to find our significance, we find our story in God's glory. Let's repent. Let's come to God. Let's ask him to do a new work.
on the night when Jesus Christ gave himself for us to tell us how much we are worth what's our value he took the bread gave thanks to the father broke the bread gave to his disciples and said this is my body which is broken for you and after the supper he took the cup gave thanks to the father gave to his disciples and said this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of their sins in me you find your story in me you find your worth let us pray Lord pour out your Holy Spirit upon the elements upon the bread and the cup that as we partake in your table that we are reminded of who we are and who you are who we are in you so precious so special with a purpose with value, intrinsic worth and value you have created us. And Lord, same with the world that you so loved. Lord, as we partake in the table, help us to become the body of Christ, redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ for the world, so that we will go to the world and tell them that the price tags have been exchanged. Here is your true worth. You belong to God. So Lord, make us one for your mission. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Take the communion with the servers first. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Jesus Christ shed for you on the cross. The blood of Jesus Christ shed for you on the cross. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Jesus Christ shed for you on the cross. Two stations, one on my right and one on my left. Thank you. And I will come to the aisles and the pews. If you raise your hands, I will minister to you there. Thank you.
is there anyone else in the pews who has not received the communion please raise hand and we'll come to you The first stanza only. Let us rise. able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to the power of the Holy Spirit that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and through the church in the world. Go in peace and let the world know that you are created to glorify God. In God's glory you find your story. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.